Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we're on uh, lesson, the seventh lesson, and, and uh, there is, uh, I'm, I don't know, I'm, an, I'm assuming there is, but a handout that looks very similar to this on the connections counter out there. Uh, if you want to follow along and fill in the blanks on some of the things, just kind of help you keep, keep track of where we're at and what we're talking about, you're welcome to get those. Uh, there may be even some that are stapled together, that, which is, includes all of the lessons all at one time. And so, uh, so we've got a PowerPoint. We're going to go through that. And, and uh, so the, most of the blanks you'll see on the PowerPoint if, if everything is synchronized. That's always a challenge. So anyway, evolution and fossils is what I want to talk about tonight. This is kind of like the, uh, the juicy stuff that people like to to bring up when it comes to talking about evolution and reality and truth of God and so on. And so first I want to start with as a, as a, as a reminder is first Peter chapter three, verse 15, which says, sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you the reason of the hope that lieth in you, ask you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And so this is kind of like a mandate from the apostle Peter uh, he's given us the foundation of for being ready to be able to tell somebody else why you have hope in God. That's really what the statement says. Be ready to answer, always have an answer, always give an answer to every man that asks you the hope of the, the reason of the hope that is in you. What hope do you have? Well, I hope, I don't, I mean, I, it's a fact, hope. My hope is in, based on fact that I'm going to go to heaven. And I want everybody else to have that same, that same confidence in the reality that you're going to heaven. So this mandate is by Peter is to be able to give an answer when somebody says, well, why do you believe that? Or I don't, you know, you're wrong. Well, let me tell you why I'm right. And I, I mentioned it before we started uh, the study that, that one of the coolest things about, about all of this is that you don't have to have a blind faith. You know, the, the, the world, the, the, the lost world, likes to accuse Christians of, well, you just have blind faith. Well, no, I'm pretty well, I can see. I mean, I'm not, I'm not blind. I can see. And even Ron, who has, is, doesn't have sight, he's not blind to the truth. He sees it. He knows it's real. He understands. I hope I'm not speaking out of turn, Ron. But uh, I think that you believe this stuff. Amen. Okay, so, so we have... We have evidence. We, what, what I refer to from the beginning of this study, a, a um, uh, factual ev um, uh, evidence. We have an e the actual phrase is evidential faith. We have an evidential faith. And we're not blind faith. We have evidential faith. And all we're doing in this study is going through some of the evidence. Now, this is not all the evidence. This is by no means is this all the evidence. Even when I teach this topic in the Bible Institute, uh, we get a little bit more in-depth. It's still not the, all the evidence. There's so much more that can be talked about. But we're just kind of touching on, you know, just kind of just, just going over the surface of, of most of this stuff. So this training in the art of offering a reasonable explanation grounded in logic, science, philosophy, and scripture, as well as other disciplines, is critical in obeying, in, to obey the mandate. You need to know this stuff, science, philosophy, uh, logic, all of those kind of things. You know, Christians don't have to be ignorant of all of the stuff that's going on in the world and the accusation that, well, you just re you refute science. That's absolutely not. I, I embrace science. Everyone, you know how I know I embrace science? Because I'm still alive. Science has kept me alive. I mean, God's actually kept me alive. I give him the credit for it. But, but my body is still, still here through all of the cancer treatments and everything. That's all science. I believe in science. I hope you do too. Okay, so to give an answer is to offer what the Greeks called an apologetic. That phrase that's up there in the middle of the, of the verse, to give an answer. To give an answer, that, there's, there's one Greek word called apologia that's translated into the English to give an answer. The word apologia is where we get the, 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 the topic apologetics, which simply means to offer an explanation, to give an answer to offer what the Greeks call that apologetic. It means to offer a defense or to a reply 
to offer a reply with a valid answer to any skeptic or seeker who wants to know why we have the hope of God in our life. Paul said also to Timothy, he said in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, uh, verse 25 and 26, he says in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. You know, what people, are want, they want to get opposed, they, they oppose themselves to God because they deny his existence. And so you and I, according to this verse, we are supposed to instruct those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure would give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. You know, you get that repentance when you say, you know what? Duh, there is a God. And then they realize, well, there is a God. And so I repent. I believe now. In meekness, it goes on, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure would give them repentance. I think I actually got that in there twice. I don't know why. But anyway, in my notes, it's in there twice. Okay, so let's talk about, this is the topic. Evolution is, tonight, is tonight's topic, evolution and fossils. And that's what we're going to try to get ourselves through tonight. So let's talk about evolution first. Evolu what is evolution anyway? When we talk about evolution, we need to define our terms and make sure we're all on the same page. So here's this. Um, there's been, there has always been advocates of a godless world, whether in science or religion, in the fact the earliest known teaching of evolution comes from a guy by the name of Anamaxar, or Anna, Mac, Anna A, A, I can't say this. I'm, I'm, bear with me here. Anamander. Anna, it sounds like a lizard. Anamaxander. About 525 BC, he wrote that man arose from a fish. Uh, now, so, so the first time that anybody ever said man came from fish was this guy, Anna, Anna, Anna Examander. An ex-mander, don't call it that. Uh, then there were Greek and Roman philosophers who believed the universe evolved through naturalistic action. And then in 1930, um, 1377, the year 1377, a leading Muslim scholar wrote, a, a leading Muslim scholar wrote that man descended from monkeys. So the idea that man came from monkeys actually came from a, a Mormon. But the credit for the massive effort in science to teach evolution is given to Charles Darwin. I think most everybody here knows Charles Darwin's name, right? That's a picture of Charles Darwin there. Um, he gets the credit for everything. Um, he wrote this book, and the book title is extremely long. I don't have it printed anywhere. But the, on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races, that is literally in the, in the title, favored races, in the struggle for life, published in 1539. So let's define evolution here real quick for you. Uh, in fact, I already have it on the screen for you, and that's your blanks there. And evolution is biolo biological evolution is descent with modification. Uh, this definition encompasses small-scale evolution, which are changes in gene frequency in a population from one generation to the next. Uh, it also includes large-scale evolution, or the descent of different species from a common ancestor over many generations. Now, it's really amazing that they would use the phrase descent instead of ascent, to rise up, to grow up from. But they use the word descent because they don't even know what's true. We're not descending from lower forms of life to higher forms of life. We're not descending, and we're certainly not descending from higher forms of life to lower forms of life. That's why evolution is not right there. And the, 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 the definition is, is a problem here for, for people, for me anyway, when I read that. So def, descent with modification refers to a genetic modification over time that transforms a species into a different species, into something different. That's what, when they talk about modification, they're talking about a genetic modification, a change in genetics over time that that transforms one species into another. Now, just so you know where I get all these, these things, that I got this from Berkeley, Berkeley University. So that right off their website. Um, evolutionists claim four, mechan four mechanisms for change. They claim four mechanisms for change, and some actually do happen. There are these changes. They do happen, not in the way they claim it, but they do happen, and I'll explain what I mean in, when I get to it. Um, Okay, so the first one is mutation. Errors in DNA due to errors, I'm sorry, genetic change in DNA due to the errors in, in replication in cells. Okay, so basically, 
a genetic defect is a mutation. And I, I think most of us would kind of know that. I mean, we, we get that. We understand when we're talking about the word mutation. Uh, and so a genetic error in a birth, in a, in a baby's birth, as, she, as the baby is being developed, and there's a genetic error, that baby is born with a genetic defect. This is common knowledge. I mean, people know this stuff all the time because it happens to many people's family where they have a genetic uh, defect, some sort of si situation going on with a, with a birth, whether it's a child or an animal birth or whatever, genetics change that causes a genetic defect. And I wanted, At this point, I would just have to say, well, if a mutation is ev evolution and God doesn't exist and the only way we can get from one to the other is through mutation, then we shouldn't, we shouldn't be fighting genetic change, genetic defects in, in the human life. We shouldn't be trying to research how to, how to, how to protect people from genetic defects. We should, we should want genetic defects. Now, I'm going to let that just percolate in your mind. But that's how I see it. If mutation is... If mutation leads a, is one of the mon, one of the me mechanisms to lead us to um, to evolutionary one species to another species type of thing, then mutations are a good thing. And if mutations are a good thing, then every mutation is a good thing, every one of them, because if we stop a mutation from happening in the persons when they're like when they're born, and we stop that genetic mutation then we just stopped what they could possibly become in their future. Now, that sounds kind of sick to say it like that. So I'm hesitant. That you're all like, you're weird, you know. But, I mean, that's, but that's, just, that's just logic. To me, that's a logical process. Okay, the next uh, mechanism is migration. Integration of like creatures with differing characteristics Migrating, and I'm not talking about moving from one part of the, like going from Canada to Mexico, like we talked about the monarch butterfly, not migrating, not that kind of migration. This would be like taking two dogs, like a, a Labrador and a poodle. Everybody knows what that makes, right? A Labrapoodle. And they're expensive dogs. I don't know, anyway, but that's, that's migration where we mix things one, one to another and so on, but th that doesn't always happen because not every not every mutation like this and a m migration type of thing uh, can reproduce itself. It's just not possible. The third uh, mechanism is uh, genetic drift. This would be the genetic shift in a population highlighting a particular characteristic. Now, this is what they really like to point to in changing things, and we'll talk about uh, some of the examples from. Charles Darwin's research, but this would be a uh, a shift when some high, some some genetic change in in a in a species added something beneficial to that species, and it became a regular thing every time an, another generation was born, and it became positive. The last one is natural selection, the traits that allow for populations to emphasize survival and reproduction resulting in higher surviving offspring. Now, let me just say this. Natural selection isn't any big deal. It's just some, some, some species of animals can survive better than others in a particular set of circumstances. That's natural selection. Um, my, the migration is, as we gave the example of mixing dog breeds, uh, they're still dogs, by the way. They're, they're, they're no, we're not talking about a dog and a goat. We're talking about dog and dog, and they produce a different kind of dog. Okay, so those are the things. But the central idea of all of this is that all life on Earth shares a common ancestor. That's what evolution tells us. That's a quote I've gotten from them. All life on Earth shares a common common ancestor through the process of descent with modification, a single common ancestor gives rise to a fantastic diversity of life forms. Evolution means that we're all distant cousins. Now, nobody wants to say this, but I'll say it because I'm in trouble here already, so I'm going to say things. Um, humans and oak trees are related. 
You ever think about stuff like that? I mean, if every life form came from a started at a pre-existing beginning life form, simple life form, and then all life forms came from that, then someplace along the living tree, we be, or the you know the 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 um, the descendant list, we're connected to oak trees. We're connected to grass. We're connected to anything that's alive. I mean, that, that is how far you have to take this. But evolution don't want to talk about that kind of stuff. They'll branch it out. Well, I'll show you some, some lines on trees or, or you know, descendant trees where, well, that doesn't make sense. But they'll tell you that it does. So anyway, evolution only occurs when there's a change in gene frequency within a population over time. That's their claim. These genetic differences are her heritable and can be passed along to the next generation. What really matters in evolutionary thinking is long-term change because we're, we're talking thousands, tens of thousands, maybe even hundreds of thousands of years, millions of years. That's why the earth has to be 60 million years old. The universe has to be billions of years old. So all of these changes have time to, to, to imp implement themselves. What really matters is long-term change. But what about the major pieces of evidence that present that are presented for evolution? When you look at the evidence that are presented, what do we? Are they valid evidences? Uh, this is what this is what they look like today. We'll talk about that further on. Okay, so let me talk about error, error evolutionary error. First thing you got to keep in mind is evolution is not a theory. It's not a theory. Um, Evidences that are commonly offered for proof of evolution in textbooks and natural history museums are referred to as icons of evolution. You remember when, when Jeremy was here, and then I kind of followed up on Jeremy last week or two weeks ago now, I'm not sure when it was. But anyway, he talked about icons of creation. He mentioned a few. He talked about the butterfly, the giraffe, and so on. Well, I'm going to show you a list of, six, of 25 icons of creation and 16 uh, icons of, of, of evolution, and we'll compare them as best we can. Okay, so David Stone, who's a PhD in physics, he said this about evolution. In any aspect of philosophy, fantasy of evolution, uh, the f in any aspect of the philosophy slash fantasy of evolution, there is no theory. This is a PhD. I think he knows what he's talking about. There's no theory for formation of the first protein. There's no theory for the first DNA molecule or strand. There's no, th there's no theory for the first cellular substructures, the first cell, the multi-cell creatures, transition between kind, et cetera. They're just stories. So when a, when a evolutionary scientist presents their position, they're not presenting a theory. They're presenting stories. They're connecting things together in a story format. He goes on, he says, there are, there is, there are no genetic data not a single observed case of mutation, natural selection, producing new complex tissues, organs, or creatures. And, then, and so, so he's, he's denying that, that there's a case for a theory. So if there's, no, there's not a theory, there's also not a hypothesis. Uh, evolution is not a, a hypothesis would be a reasonable explanation of observed facts consistent with known physical laws and so on employing data and analysis. So basically, you take all your, your evidences and you say, my hypothesis is this is what's going on. And so my hypothesis would be God is real. But evolution is not just a hypothesis. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4 says, uh, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust they heap upon themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Fable is the story. So we've, we have everything we need at our disposal right now, you and I, we have everything that we need to address evolution. The first thing that we have is we had the wisdom of God. That goes in your first, in your blank there. So let me grab my Bible because I didn't put this on the slide. But if you turn over to 2 Corinthians I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19.
1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 19 through 29. Paul writes, For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the, the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the rest, wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. So we're going to go down to verse 29. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. Because the wisdom, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For ye see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty, and base things of the world, and things which are despised. Hath God chosen, yea, has God chosen, yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So here's the point. Starting in verse 1 all the way down to um, verse 20, God says, I will destroy the wisdom of men. And I believe that God is allowing man to come condemn himself by the willful declaration that there is no God. Man, when, man, when man rejects that there is a God, they're condemning themselves, according to this passage. Imagine what the day will look like for the unbeliever when Christ sets his foot on Mount Olives. According to Zechariah chapter 14, it says, everyone will flee for their lives. So the, the unbeliever, the rejecter, that God doesn't exist, that Christ isn't coming back, he's going to like, wow, he did come back. And then he will turn and run as well. In verse 20, God will make the wisdom of men foolishness. And in verses 27 and 28, God had chosen foolish and weak things of the world for an express purpose, which is to confound the wise of men, the wisdom of men. And then in verse 29, he says, so there is no foolish, there shall will, there will be no fleshly glory in the presence of Jesus Christ. And so the thing that we have available to us, to you and me right now, we have God's wisdom available as one of the ways to refute to, to address evolution as an error. And, and so we have his wisdom. We have it, and where do we get his wisdom? We get it out of the Bible. This is God's mind for us. He's laid out his mind. It's not everything in his mind, but it's everything God wants you to know and giving every tool you need to address the foolish, foolish wisdom of men. Not only do we have the wisdom of God, but we also have the Word of God. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now let me take you back to about a month and a half ago when we were talking about when we were first getting started and I laid out four, four circles and I put down that, that uh, uh, this, this verse... The, the reproof, correction, instruction, and right, and uh, and um, doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction was all part of what it is to give God to give an answer to the man, to any of that have to ask the hope of the reason of the, of the hope that you have in, within you. And so we talked about that, and I'm bringing that back. I just want to remind you of that the prophet from God's word is far above that the prophet of Darwin's book. Darwin's book is not a very profitable book to you in your life. It doesn't really affect you in any, in any real way and not like the bible does the bible furnishes us with all that we need to know regarding truth the third thing that we have is that we have the spirit of god first john 2 27 but the anointing which you have received of him abideth in you and ye need not that any man teach you but it, uh, but as the same anointing teaches you of all things and is truth and is no lie, and even as it has taught you, you shall abide in him. That's the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is that teacher. The Spirit of God, that's, what the, that's one of the functions of the Spirit of God, 
is to be your teacher, to explain what God is doing and, and give you the answer. So while men and women can teach, only the, whole, only the Holy Spirit can teach all truth. And so Jesus Christ sent us the Spirit for the purpose of teaching us truth. Uh, now, in the middle of all of this, maybe some people are thinking, well, what about, you may have heard a phrase called the theistic re evolution. Theistic evolution. I want to make a real quick comment about that. It's not on the slides. But theistic evolution, there have been attempts by men, many to integrate evolutionary teaching with the biblical teaching of creation. They try to take what's what Genesis is talking about and wrap that around evolutionary stories and make what the Bible says teach evolution. That's, and then, of course, if, if, if the Bible is being used, then God is real, and if God is real, then God is evolving everything, and everything is just under God's control to evolve. That's called theistic evolution, and that is not a good doctrine to follow. The lessons of generous are numerous, and we, do, and we, we will examine some of them soon, but right, really, the best place you can get that is we're starting this HBI this fall. Genesis, the first 12 chapters of Genesis is in the first semester, and the rest of chapter, the rest of Genesis is in the second semester. And we dig into all of this stuff. We go down and deep into that. I'd encourage you to consider enrolling in that class. The lessons of Genesis are numerous, and we will examine some of them in that class. But for now, know that Genesis in no way teaches an evolutionary doctrine. Genesis does not teach evolution. No matter, I mean, we're not going to take the time tonight to talk about how many, what a, what a day is, you know, in the, in the morning, in the evening, in the first day, the second day. We're not going to deal with all of that today. Um, anyway, let me just show you this uh, picture or this chart. So, uh, Jeremy hit on, I think, four or five icons of, of, of creation. There's actually, I have a list of 25 of them. I'm not going to go through them all. I just want to throw them up here so you can think about them. Like, oh, that's, a, that's truth of, a, of creation. The monarch butterfly we talked about, that, and, uh, Jeremy brought that up. The trilobite. Anybody know what a trilobite is? It's an ancient undersea water creature. It was floated around the bottom of the ocean, and it was a really cool, we will talk about him later on, because they use that as a, one of the icons of evolution but they just got it backwards. The living cell. Okay, so I think everybody knows that your body is made up of several billion cells. We talked about your blood, your blood system, how many, how many cells in your blood system. The living cell, whether it's a human cell or the cell of a dandelion or anything, the cell, every living, every living cell is incredibly unique. Uh, I, I don't remember too much when I was in, in high school and looking at a magnifying, looking through a telescope, looking at cells. But maybe some of you guys do. And when you looked at that cell, wasn't that a, just an amazing, all the stuff that's inside a, a single cell? Like an amoeba, you have to talk about amoebas and so on when you're in school. Okay, so anyway, um, the human eye, we talked about the human eye. Uh, human brain, the brain is an amazing thing. Um, we won't have, again, like I said, we're not talking about all these tonight, but the human hand, if you look at your hand and think about just how dexterous you are, it's incredible what your hand can do. The blood, we talked about blood clotting, we, uh, Pasteur's experiments, that's Louis Pasteur's experiments, uh, artificial breeding experiments, uh, like um, Jacob, the Bible, the Bible study on Jacob. Uh, giraffe's blood, we talked about giraffes. We talked about the bombardier beetle. I'll show you that video. Uh, amphibian egg, uh, bird flight feather, uh, bird migration, bird song, uh, r red blood cells, lima beans. Lima beans. Yeah, you need to read up about lima beans. They're pretty cool. I know nobody likes to eat them, but they're a cool uh, creation icon. Variety of life, harmony of the sim uh, and symbosis, uh, reproduction. Reproduction is incredible. All kinds of reproduction, no matter what it is. All kinds of reproduction is incredible. Corn, yeah, you get along that with corn and lima beans. Uh, bees, bees are cool. If it wasn't for bees, there wouldn't be a lot of pollination going on in the world. Uh, eels, what's the deal with an electric eel? You know, electric eel can kill a, cro a crocodile. 
There's enough voltage in an electric eel to kill a crocodile. And then bats. That'll do, we'll stop there. So that's, that's a long list, and you can kind of, I mean, just think about stuff. There's just all kinds of things in the world, in your life, that you have access to. Like, that is evidence of creation. That is evidence of God. It's an amazing thing. I mean, that's a long list, but that's not all of them. There's a lot more of them. There's literally thousands of things that you could think of that would be an evidential item to prove that God does exist that God created everything that exists. Okay, uh, so here's the icons of, oh, I, uh, I call them evolutionary tales or fairy tales. Okay, it's natural selection, beneficial mutations, the fossil record. We're going to talk about the fossil record tonight. Homology, we'll talk about homology tonight. The peppered moth, I'll talk about that. Darwin's finches, four, four winged fruit flies. That's, a, that's pretty wild. Lucy, anybody know who Lucy is? Lucy is a fossil. Well, she, not really. They say, but nah. Uh, Laetoli footprints, vestigial organs, embryo charts, Miller's experiments, horse evolution, whale evolution. Uh, I can never say that. That uh, archaeopteryx and bird evolution. Maybe you can say that better than me. And then, of course, billions of years is. Uh, evidence for uh, evolution. We're not going to get into all of those either, but we will touch on a few of them tonight. Okay, let's talk about Darwin's terms. In Darwin's terms, natural selection refers to survival of the fittest. In Darwinian terms, anything, when we're talking about, that's, that is their big topic. No, normally, the natural selection is, is the biggest thing. Uh, not genetics, not uh, some of those other things that we mentioned, but uh, it is the survival of the fittest. Natural selection is a process. Natural selection is a process by which genetically based traits improve survival or reproduction of the low, of the host species. So, natural selection. Something changes. Something. Something that that a species develops. Like Jeremy was talking about the giraffe, and he I, he I thought he said it. Maybe he didn't, but I'll say it anyway. You know, so there was a time when giraffes had a short neck, really short, like a horse. And then the giraffe said, but there's leaves on the top of that tree. If only I could stretch my neck, I could get to the top of the tree and eat the leaves up there and survive. And so he did. The, the giraffe grew his neck. I know it took several generational cycles for the giraffe to get a longer neck but that would be natural selection where the giraffe with a longer neck was able to survive the, and the giraffe with a short neck died because the leaves on the bottom of the tree or the lower portion of the tree were all gone and that giraffe couldn't eat, so it died. So the only reason we have long neck giraffes now is because they could reach the top of the tree. But the giraffe did that. It's really, I don't know how they come up with those things, but it's just a story. Okay, I lost my place. Okay. Over millions of years, tiny changes produced new structures and new, new creatures. Darwin called this descent with modification, the term we already talked about. So let me give you some quotes from people who are Darwinists, uh, evolutionary scientists. Uh, this guy here is uh, Douglas Futuyama. He's an evolutionary biologist. And he says that Darwinism is the theory of random purposeless variations acted on by blind, purposeful, natural selection. A lot of blindness going on there. Okay, so that's what he claims. Richard Dawkins, he's a biologist, he said, natural selection, the blind, unconscious, automatic process by which Darwin discovered, has no purpose in mind and no mind's eye. It does not plan for the future. It has no vision, no foresight, no sight at all. Yet it happens. I mean, okay, so logically you should be able to pick that apart pretty easily. Uh, but we don't have time. P Peter Atkins is professor of chemistry at Oxford. Since it has no need or, of purpose, all the extraordinary, wonderful richness of the world can be expressed as growth from the dunghill of purposelessness, purposeless, intercorrected corruption. What's he saying there? And there's, 
The only purpose that you're, you're basically saying that you you exist because and there's no purpose for you existing. You just you just came out of the dunghill. Is that what he said? Yeah, dunghill. He used the word dunghill. I think everybody knows what that means. Came out of a pile of. George Gaylord Simpson, a paleontologist. Man is the result of a purposeless and natural process that did not have him in mind. Okay, well, that's your thought. But let me give you some answers. How do you respond to an evolutionary person? Let me give you five things that you need, that you need to have to be able to respond. Five answers. Natural selection only explains variation within a species. Okay, when somebody says, well, natural selection, you say, well, that only explains variation. Variations, I mean, things are different. Like, not every dog is a collie. How many dogs variations are there? Does anybody know? I've never looked that up, but how many different dogs are there? Hmm? At least 100? Okay, at least, let's, we'll go with 100 for now. Okay, so here, here, here's the, uh, the classic, the finch beak. The finch remains a finch, no matter how big of a beak it has. Natural selection might explain the size of a finch's beak, but it cannot explain the transfer between species. So some, some finches have a bigger beak than others, or, or a, a beak that can work its way down into the bark of a tree and get the bugs out of the tree to eat it and survive. Not every beak, not every finch has that, but that didn't change because of evolution. It's just some, some beaks were, they were born it's like, okay, I have brown eyes. My wife has green eyes. I can't remember. I'm sorry. But what does our sons have? Hazel and brown. Okay, so they're a little different. They're kind of a mixture. But, I mean, they're still eyes. They didn't get them because of selection or anything. They just happened. Uh, the peppered moth. Okay, some moths were lighter colors and could hide out on a tree and, and, be avoid, and avoid being eaten by another bird. And some of them were dark and they could hide out on, on a darker tree and, and survive. That's just, it didn't change anything. It, was, it wasn't because of evolution. It wasn't because of natural selection. The color of the moth may change, but it is still a moth. It's, no matter what you look at, it's still a moth. Apple maggots. One of the examples of here is, is that the apple maggot, the apple maggot eat, used to, well, probably still does to some degree, but they're not calling that anymore. Uh, they eat apples, but this has not always been true. They used to feed on a plant called a hawthorn fruit and were called hawthorn maggots then. Now we just, because we find them in apples, we call them apple maggots. Now, did we change? No, they're still a maggot. They just, they just went from one fruit tree to another fruit tree. Darwin's book, titled Origin of the Species, never spoke of origins. It just talked about variety. That's something that you need to keep in mind. He, even though he's titled it, the major title is Origin of the Species, he never once addressed the issue of what is the origin of the species, of any species. He never, he never addressed it. In fact, it was one of the biggest things that drove him crazy. Well, not literally crazy, but it, it frustrated him that he could not answer the question, what was the origin of the species, even though that was the title of his book. His book did demonstrate the variety within a species, which is biblical for plants, insects, and animals. I mean, that, that, the variety of, of, of everything is, is God's handiwork. Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit tree yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And in verse 24, God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature after his kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth after his kind, and it was so. When he uses the expression his kind, that's a, that's a, a species, a, gender, a, a particular type of, of animal or living life form. Natural selection, this is your second uh, uh, way to address evolution. Natural selection can only select. It can never build new. It can only select. Natural selection cannot see the future and work towards a goal. That's what God did. God saw the future. He established the future and he worked towards that goal. 
it cannot, no, I don't want to say that God worked. I mean, God knew what was happening and he put everything in place to, to accomplish his plan. Uh, natural selection cannot see the future, but it can, and it can, natural selection cannot produce new genetic information or structures. The third thing you can argue back again is natural selection would only select what would be available for immediate survival. Partly formed structures. Okay, so let's take apart the eye for a minute real quick. So you have um, different kinds of cells. You have cone cells, and I can't think of the other one right now. What's the other cone? Rods. Cones and rods, yeah. And they, they, they affect what you see and they, the colors that you see and the patterns that you see and all that stuff. Well, you gotta, for the human eye, you've got to have all of those things to be able to see color. So... If you didn't, if the, if the eye was, was to be selected to, um, to produce itself uh, through natural selection, it would have to have all of those pieces available to bring them and scoop them together and put them in an order to make it work. But that didn't happen. Partly formed structures are useless in survival and therefore would not be preserved for future use. Human or any life form, I mean, if, if, if it's like, Okay, I have a growth on my elbow. I'm going to shake it off. Or it's not going to be reproduced in my children. That, that, that bump on my elbow won't be reproduced in my children. The wing of a bird is thought to have developed over time, not, not in one generation. That would be another example. Um, the fact is a partial wing is no wing at all. A bird can't fly with a partial wing. You know, it's... I'll show you pictures of the wings here in a moment. You probably have seen these kind of stuff. Scales would pro would supposedly which supposedly turned into feathers would lose their ability to protect the soft body tissue below that and make the animal vulnerable to attack, and those animals would die. So scales didn't become feathers, as they claim, because the animal wouldn't have been able to survive without its scales. The scales provided protection to the animal. Natural selection, number four, natural selection requires competition for survival. Romans 8, 22, for we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain and together until now. So Darwin described, he, he used this phrase, he, uh, this, this uh, competition, he, called, he said, red in tooth and claw. Anybody ever heard that expression? Red and tooth and claw. Basically, what that means is the the animals that are, are that are there, they kill each other with tooth and claw, so that they can survive. You would, as a human being, you would you would kill your neighbor so you could get their water. That's the kind of stuff that 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 competition breeds, and then red and tooth and claw implies. Uh, I'm going to live, you're not, so I'm going to kill you so, so I can take what you have, red in tooth and claw. What is witnessed, though, in nature is symbiosis and inter interrelatedness of plants and animals. Now, symbiosis, we didn't get too far into it last week, but remember we talked about the, mama, the, mo the monarch butterfly, that what was the plant that the monarch butterfly could only lay its eggs on? Milkweed plant. It, it doesn't lay its eggs on anything else. And the milkweed plant had to be in existence for the monarchs to land on so that they could have a protected place for their eggs, their, their eggs to hatch and become caterpillars that eventually become butterflies. So we call this an ecosystem. And that's what naturalists and, and nature pres preserve people are. That's what they strive for is that is that, um, that balance of nature, right? We want to make sure our balance, you know, we, we don't want to kill off all these certain kinds of life, life in this piece of ground because it infects or affects uh, the other life that are there. Good example would be we just went to Yellowstone a few weeks ago and everybody was talking, not everybody out there, but people have talked about the fact that they reintroduced the wolf into Yellowstone. Why did they do that? Because when they took the wolf out, it affected the, the ecosystem. So that's the symbiosis that, that uh, um, 
that I was kind of referring to. So natural selection is just a, it's a valid process. It does happen. It happens all the time. Uh, Jacob, as I mentioned Jacob earlier, he manipulated the appearance of the goats and cattle. I mean, some were, some were uh, I can't remember the term, striped, and there was one other term, but anyway, he, he manipulated his, his livestock so that he could, he could profit. Darwin did it with pigeons. Dog breeders employ it all the time. Horse breeders do it, and so do many other uh, animal breeders. They, they do that. They breed the animals as, to try to uh, enhance certain characteristics in the offspring. So it's a technique of enhancing attributes, but it does nothing to originate a new species. Nobody's going to take a couple of horses and try to make a, a two champion horses and try to reproduce a, a, a donkey. No, they won't do that. Okay, but what are beneficial mutations? Let's talk about that real quick. Oh, I got, I'm sorry, I got one more. Uh, natural selection cannot, repro cannot produce new life. And so we already talked about that, but that, that was what is your blank. So beneficial mutations. A mutation is an error in the DNA code. I already mentioned that before. It's, a DNA, it's an error in the DNA code, an alteration of the genetic code, making, making it change. And sometimes it's deadly to the host. Genetic DNA changes will kill the host. A change in an organism, organism's DNA can change all aspects of its life. Now, mutations are random but occur for one of two reasons. There's two reasons, one of two reasons why mutations happen. Uh, let me get to this. Um, the DNA failed to copy correctly. That would be one thing. Uh, I've learned, having, having cancer, and probably many of you that have had cancer and gone through chemotherapy had learned, a lot of times the chemotherapy, the purpose of chemotherapy is to try to affect the DNA structure of the cancer cell to kill the cancer cell. Did you guys know that? I think that's an amazing thing that DNA in the cancer cell is, a, is affected by the chemical of the chemotherapy, the chemo, chemo medicine you're taking. It gets into the DNA of the cancer cell, so when it tries to reproduce, it kills the cancer cell. That's beneficial mutation, and it's an incredibly amazing thing that that's what happens. I didn't know that until I got cancer. Natural selection acts on this mutation, which advances over prior genetic code, thus producing new types of structures and creatures, supposedly. So there are problems with beneficial mutations, though, several problems. Um, let me back to, there's the first, first problem. A beneficial mutation is a mutation that occurs which adds information. That would be beneficial. It adds information. But the problems are um, mutations never add any real information. Uh, so I have a quote here I want to read from a uh, guy from Columbia University. He says, a, made, a majority of mutations, both those arising in laboratories and those stored in natural populations, produce deteriorations of viability, heredity, disease, and monstrosities. John Hopkins University biophysics physicist Dr. Lee Spinter wrote this. He said, uh, not even one mutation has been observed that adds a little bit of information to the genome without causing it damage. Okay, I, iconic mutations. Now there are some. There, so we, okay, so you, they'll they'll present their argument. You'll present your your resistance. They will present. They'll push back again with two examples of uh, iconic mutations. There are two examples. Uh, I think everybody's heard of sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is considered by many to be an example of beneficial mutation because it provides protection from malaria. But, but sickle cell anemia can kill. But those that have sickle cell anemia, they don't get malaria. Because you know why? Because their blood cells are deformed, look like a sickle. That's the disease part of that. It hinders oxygen transport, it causes organ damage, and increases exposure to other infections. 
Sickle cell anemia is more harmful than helpful and does not demonstrate transformation into a new species either. Yes. Well, I pointed out at the, his title, he used the phrase racial in there. So, yeah, I would agree. Um, okay, another uh, um, mutation that is, that is lifted up as, as a positive thing is Staphylococcus bacterium, staph. Uh, it's resistance to penicillin. Staph, staph infection is resistant to penicillin. So that's a good thing, they say. That's an example of evolutionary positive things changing. No new genetic information is ever added, though, so no, no species-to-species -species evolution is ever witnessed. Generally, resistive strains are already present in the population and survive an elimination from weaker strains. At best, this is an adaptation within species, as seen in two examples. So there was a couple of examples where uh, they dug up a guy in 1988, an Arctic explorer, he died in 1845, so almost, two, almost 200 years ago. He was recovered and bacteria in his intestines was found to be resistant to modern antibiotics. I can't even imagine why the guy would have thought to do a test like that. Let's cut this carcass open and see if he'll handle the antibiotics that we have for him today. Maybe we can bring him back to life. I don't know what they were thinking. The second thing is that the bacteria itself mutates, causing a loss of genetic code responsive to antibiotics. And let me give you a word of caution here. Genetic research is generally cited as proof of evolution, but genetic research is, and I've already talked to you about what I think genetic research is, probably should be canceled. If you really believe in evolution, you, sh you should want genetic change. You should want genetic mutations. But anyway, many atheists are running to the genetics um, territory as a final and ultimate proof of evolution for two reasons. They want to go there for two reasons. The traditional re uh, reason for evolution have been effectively refuted. So all of the stuff that, all these icons of, of evolution that I've already talked about and many more, they basically have been refuted by science, not by religion, but by science, that those things don't hold water. So they say, okay, well, let's, let's go to genetics because we can live in genetics. Kind of like going to, uh, um, what's that math stuff? Um, I'm sorry, I can't think of the word right now. It'll come to me. Um, after, ah, well, it's quantum physics. That's what, you know, so they'll go to quantum physics and they'll go to, they'll go to genetics. But anyway, because most of the stuff has been canceled. But the second reason, second reason they'll go there is because most people are not equipped to analyze genetic research. I couldn't read a genetic research report. I wouldn't know the first thing. I, would. I mean, I'd have to look up every word they wrote. Uh, so therefore, the average person can't refute Darwinist claims in the area of genetic research. This is why they typically make no effort to simplify the results of genetic research. They make it as hard as possible for you to read it. And, you, and unless you've gone to school to study genetic research, you're not going to know what they're talking about. So... Genetics is, is, their, is like their last vestige of where they can hang out. But I think my, my, re, my, ref, my reference to genetics is probably the biggest argument that they can't refute. Why, why try to stop genetic deficiencies? Just let it happen. Because that might become the next greatest thing to the human, human race. Whatever that genetic deficiency is might be, might be the thing that makes us live forever. And you want to stop it? You don't know what you're doing. So anyway, that's just my thoughts. Okay, one thing that we're kind of moving on, uh, another icon was what I, the, the word homology. And homology is a similarity between creatures. And I kind of already gave some examples. Let me say what Darwin said about homology. He said, I should infer from analogy that probably all the organic beings which have ever lived on this earth have descended from some one primordial form. He's saying, 
Basically, I can infer my, my studies and everything I would read, we all came from the same thing. Every life form came from the same thing. We're, that's why I said that we're all related to an oak tree. I mean, Darwin probably believed that as well. He just didn't want to say it that way. So what Darwin is saying, though, is that there's similarity between creatures. Practically every, every modern biology textbook in every natural history museum uses homology as an evidence for evolution. And they'll have a picture like this. Maybe you recall seeing a picture like this. So I, I, let me turn around here. On your left, you have uh, a human arm. The next one, the second one is a lizard arm. The third one is a cat arm. The fourth one is a whale arm. The fifth one is a bat arm. Then you have a frog and then a bird. And man, don't they all look similar? Some are bigger than others, but they, you know, they got, a, they got a femur bone or whatever that arm bone, the upper bone, two bones in your forearm and your wrist and all the bones in your hand. We, kinda, we, we, have, to be, we have to be the same. We look the same, similar. That would be their position. Practically every modern textbook or every science museum you go to will make this claim. These homogeneous structures provide evidence of a common ancestor. That's what it says in Prentice Hall's biology book of 2002. They, on this picture, they use, provide evidence of a common ancestor because, well, they kind of look sort of maybe like the same. Okay, here's another one, the horse. Well, okay, so we start with from the left, a little bitty, I don't know how to say that word. I can't even read it from here. Um, Echipus, Olingopus, that's kind of like a hippo. I don't know. Anyway, last one I can read, modern horse. But they all kind of look like horse, so they all got to be, you know, that's got to be the, the, where the horses came from. Four-legged animals all arranged in a nascending lineage from small to large. They look vaguely like horses, and each of, every one of them has four legs. And now, here's one. You've seen this one. I think everybody's seen this one. It's actually, this is a shortened version of it because there's 15 uh, forms in the actual picture. Um, and so, one of the most effective uh, evolutionary icons was uh, what's called the Parade of Man, which depicts 15 figures evolving from apes to modern humans. All of the creatures, notice, have two arms and two legs and two ears and one nose, and they're walking upright. Apes, it's amazing how much, even on the second figure, they make, they make that ape, that creature, walking very upright, like a human being walks upright. And I think if you go to the zoo, you'll see the chimpanzees, and gorillas, and orangutans, they don't walk upright. But we're going to draw it, the picture like it kind of is like a walking upright because it's kind of similar to a human. This is where we came from. So it's, well, I mean, the, the, you know, the only thing I can say to that is the species doesn't go away just because we morph into a new species. The species is still there, but, it, you know, in the litter, the... The mommy ape had two kids. One is a human-looking kid, and one is an ape-looking kid. She kicks the human-looking kid out, and it survives. I don't know. I don't know. I'm making that up, of course, because I don't know. Um, one more. This picture here is the homology is used to demonstrate the evolution of a whale. Now, the thing I want to point out here, let's see if I can do it here. This little, can you see the dot? Okay, so these, these uh, would be the, the descending lines. And so this is to demonstrate the evolution of a whale. Well, here's a whale down here. And they say the whale actually came from this animal right here. But there's no linkage. Even in their own drawings, they don't link the whale to this animal. But they say that that's the one that came from. All the creatures, uh, see, where's that? None of the individual animals in this chart are the direct ancestor of another. And that's why each of them get their own branch of the family tree. And that's actually a quote from Berkeley Evolutionary Library. Yet in the same article, they refer to these earlier species as the first whales. And they say the first whales, such as the Paquitas, which is that one there, Paquitas. That, they say that's the first whale. They were typically land animals. 
Listen, I've never heard it this way. I always heard it, they came out of the water and into the land, but now they're saying they came from the land into the water. The Pachytus was a land animal. They had long skulls and large carnivorous teeth, like a crocodile type of thing. From the outside, they don't look much like whales at all. However, their skulls, and particularly in the ear region, which was surrounded by a bony wall, strongly resemble those of living whales and are unlike those of any other mammal. Basically, the shape of the bone of the ear canal in that animal looks like the ear canal of a whale, so they had to be descendants. That's the homology that goes on there. Uh, so let me give you, how do we respond to this? Well, how do, we, how do we talk to somebody about this? So here's a couple things. Homology is used to demonstrate the evolution. Okay, that's, that's another picture. Uh, I forgot this was up there. So that's the big, whoop. Okay, I went too far. There we go. That's supposed to be a big whale, and this is the Paquita. So notice it's a, it's a walks on the ground. And this one here, that's, its legs become flippers, and front legs become flippers. It, but it kind of looks, doesn't it, doesn't it look like a whale? I mean, come on. Surely it looks like a whale. Okay, so let's go on. In response to homology, the argument from homology is based entirely on evolutionary assumption. There is an, all kinds of assumptions being made here. Similarly, the structure between creatures is zero evidence for evolution. There's no, there, there's, no, there's no real similarities at all. It could easily mean common design as common. As, so they call it common descent. We would call it common design. So think about that. I mean, God's hand is on everything that he designed. And he had a pattern. Why, are we going to limit God? He can, he, everything that he creates has to have a unique pattern? No, I think if God made a human and made a, a bat and made a cat and made a, all those bones, arm bone things, they, it's a pattern. It's just a pattern. So it's common pattern versus common descent. Uh, this is a picture of eyes. I don't know if you can see that very well, but there's different eyes up there. So you got the, an eye that's shaped like a cup. This one's shaped like a camera light. This is in a squid. Uh, this is a, can't read, uh, it's a pinhole eye. This is a mirror eye, a compound eye, and then a human eye. And so pictures in this chart does nothing to explain how increasingly compact, complex eyes ever emerged. How did they get more complex? How did, your eyes are a whole lot more complex than a, than a robin eye, a, the, the eye of a robin. You're more complex. They can see a long way. Owls can see a long way. I, you know, they can see a rat, you know, in the grass and fly over and eat it. Um, we can't do that, but our eyes are still more complex than theirs. They just have better vision. Number two, homology is based on unproven assumptions that evolution has a mechanic a mechanism that could create complex structures. To say that homology is evidence for evolution is to assume that evolution has a me mechanism that can account for the creation of complex structures, but this has never been proven. There's never been any proof given for this kind of thought. Natural selection has no creative power. It can't create a finch beak. Natural, natural selection cannot create a finch beak or a, change the color of the moth. Genetic mutation has no creative power either. Mutations are, by definition, harmful and destructive. And you, you ask anybody that talks about genetic mutations, you just ask them, well, are, are genetic mutations, are they positive? Are they good? Do, we, do I want my child to have a genetic mutation so they will maybe survive better than me? Would I want that? Would I, should I pray for that? And then they'll probably say no. The limbs, and number three, the limbs and the creatures that, that are actually shown are more different than actually similar. So here we have in this picture here, you have a penguin and a bat. Two kind of bird, kind of like animals, a penguin and a bat. So they're, they're kind of the same, but they're, they're, there's real more differences than there are the similarities. A frog's leg, a bat wing, a horse's leg are dramatically different from a human arm. Evolutionists emphasize vague similarities while ignoring vast differences. 
They ignore the differences and, and speak highly of the, the one possible characteristics that would be uh, common. At the genetic level, structures are not formed in the same way. Okay, let me wrap up evolution and then we'll jump into, we only have a few minutes, so we'll jump into fossils. Both, both ben, ben, beneficial mutation and homology offer zero evidence of the doctrine of evolution of life. In fact, um, they really teach us that evolution does not qualify as a scientific theory or even a hypothesis. It's a, miracle, it's a mythical story, but the real story is found in the Word of God. We know what the Bible says. Genesis 2.19, And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever soever Adam called them, that's what the name was. Okay, so that's, that's evolution. That's a lot of material, and we didn't go very deep into any of it, but every one of these points that I made, you could drill down into that on your own. I would encourage you to get some books. I think we have some books in the uh, books in the in the uh, resource center next Sunday. If you're here and the resource center is open, you should look at those books. I, I think I have I recommended five different books uh, that that help speak of this kind of stuff. And there's a lot of information on the internet, of course, as well. But let's talk about the fossil evidence. This is also an icon of evolution. So let me let me give you some fun fossil fun fossil facts. A fossil is a naturally preserved remains or traces of animals or plants that lived in the geologic past. That's a, what is a fossil? Well, it's a naturally preserved remains of an animal that died or a life form that died. Anybody know how many fossils are available to go look at in a museum? Take a guess, wild guess. Anybody guess this number? 200 million. 200 million fossils in the museums around the world that have been dug up out of the ground and s s shipped to a museum and the digger gets money and everybody gets happy. That's a fun fast fossil, fun, you can't even say that right, fun fossil fact. This includes millions of invertebrates and vertebrates as well as millions of plants. According to the museums, the textbooks and the documentaries, Fossils are tangible evidence of evolutionary change. This, this, this is like, this is a go-to thing for most evolutionists is the fossils evidence. The fact is the fossil evidence refutes evolution and supports creation. Now that's a different twist on things on fossils. Darwin knew the fossil record did not provide enough of evidence for missing links. He said the, he knew that the fossil evidence didn't have it. But he believed that the problem was due to the incompleteness of the, of the record. So if, if more people would dig and come up with fossils, eventually we would find uh, what he was looking for, the missing link, as pe some people like to call it. And let me give you six reasons why fossils fail, which you can use to talk to people about why fossils are not a, not a valid tool for evolution. Number one, they cannot prov prove, they cannot prove a evolutionary descent. So we've already talked about what descent is. Fossils don't prove evolution descent. Uh, all the creatures in the fossil record, this is amazing, even no matter how much of the fossil of the body you can actually dig up, all the fossils that are dug up record fully developed plants and animals. Except for I can think of one, and I'll show you that in here in a minute. Uh, but it, it's really, it doesn't put, doesn't put the, uh, evolution uh, doesn't put fossils in, in the lead. To prove Darwin evolution would, to prove Darwin, Darwinian evolution would require the existence of a vast number of partly formed creatures and organs and structures. So someplace there'd be, a, there's gotta be a, a life form fossil and then a series of intermediary changes to finally get to a li one life. And they've never been able to connect, no matter how many pieces of fossil they dig out of the ground. They cannot say this fossil is a descendant of that fossil. As it was changed someplace in the, in the path and, and produced this. 
Well, apart from a few questionable examples, the record does not demonstrate anything like this. Henry Gee, the chief science writer for Nature magazine and the author of the book In, In Search of Deep, he said this. I don't think I have his, I don't have his quote up there. To take a line of fossils and claim that they represent a lineage is not a scientific hypothesis that can be text tested, but an assertion that carries the same authority as a bedtime story, amusing perhaps, even instructive, but not scientific. That's the guy that came, the, you know, the head of Nature magazine. Okay, so number one, fossil record can't prove evolutionary. Um, I, I probably should have been clicking all of that up. There, there's his quote, McGee's quote. That's what he looks like. Uh, number two, the fossil record is the geological column. It, 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 the concept of a column has major problems. I'll explain what I mean by column here in just a moment. And probably many of you are familiar with this. Probably seen a chart. Everybody knows the, the Jurassic period, right? The ju movie Jurassic, the Jurassic movies and stuff. That was a Jurassic period. But I'll get to that in just a minute. So, the columns supposedly consist of three major periods of, of history, divided into each one of them divided into four shorter periods. So the top one, um, or I'm sorry, what would be the bottom? Let me look at this. I can't even read that. I know you can't read it. I apologize for that. That's pretty bad. The Pale Paleozoic uh, level consists of the Cambrian, Several others, I'm not going to name them all, just for the sake of me butchering the words. The age of multi-cell organisms, fish, and amphibians. This is what the Paleozoic uh, time frame had in it. The Mesozoic time frame had the age of reptiles and dinosaurs. Uh, that would include, you know, the Terzazic, the, Jur uh, the Jurassic, and the Crustaceous period. That's where you get the Jurassic uh, movies during the age of reptiles and dinosaurs. The Cenozoic period consists of animal or mammals and birds. But there's some problems with this level. Basically what they're saying is you got the top one, the middle one, and the and the bottom, which was bigger, more time frame in that. And the whole history of the universe, the whole history of Earth, is divided up, crust the, the crust of the earth is divided up into these three major groups, and each one of them is divided into four minor groups of time. And when things are found in that, in that th uh, level of soil, they say this was a Jurassic fossil or this is a, uh, 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 another one, I can't even think of another name. Okay, so there are problems with this approach. There's, there are large segments of these of this layers are missing. Um, So this would be uh, a unconformities as of the strata. How many of you have been to uh, Grand Canyon? So you've seen this. You've seen this. You've seen the layers in the dirt. You see the picture of the Grand Canyon. You see the layers of the dirt. Well, some of those layers are missing. And and not only that, but some of those uh, rock formation discovered fossils were completely out of order. Like pre-Cambrian, we're sitting on top of the Crustaceous period. How did they know that? Well, because that's what the kind of kind of fossils they found there. See, they what what they know what what level of dirt they're in based on the fossils they're in because they've cataloged this is the fossil we should find in this level. So when they find that fossil in another level, they think it's out of order. Well, how did the, how did the layers get out of order? Shouldn't have ever gotten out of order. Another problem is, uh, as I said, is, uh, so this is a picture of a tree, a fossilized tree. I don't know if you can really see it very well, but right here is the tree trunk. Can I see it curving? These are the layers that have been laid down, and that tree is ex ex growing into multiple layers. So the tree was there, and the, and the sediment was laid out. In fact, 11 different states in the United States have fossilized trees like this. 11 different states in several different countries have fossilized trees standing erect, extending through multiple layers of the, of the, um, the sediment as it was laid out. 
and I mentioned fossils that are out of order, and you've got things like the horse prints in, in Uzbekistan, human footprints in Texas next to a large animal like a, like a, like a dinosaur. Hoof prints in, are visible in the rocks in the Grand Canyon. Uh, number the third uh, ref refutation of fossils is the record actually evidence of a worldwide catastrophe. So there was a catastrophe that happened. Anybody know what that catastrophe happened? They caused all this dirt and stuff to float around and settle down in, on the ground. I think it was called a Noahic flood. Yeah, it was a flood, ocean flood. Um, I had a picture. I don't. I, I wanted to get a picture. I saw a video uh, of the in, in, in there in that video. It had a picture of a map of the United States. And it showed where most of the fossils are found in the United States. And most of the fossil beds, in what we would think about, extend from the very northern part of Mexico all the way through most of the Rocky Mountain areas, you know, Utah, Idaho, Montana, all the way up into Canada. It's like 1,400 miles of fossil beds. Every fossil you can imagine has been found in these fossil beds. And, and it stretches hundreds of miles wide, almost 1,500 miles tall from Mexico to Canada. And all the fossils are found in that area. How'd they get there? They were running from a flood. That's what was happening. They didn't get very far, and they ended up drowning. That's why they're all there together, weird animals on top of it, weird animals. Okay, let me keep going here. We're going to run out of time. Number three is to talk about the catastrophe. The, fossiliz the fossilization event in the global fossil beds did not occur naturally. The massive worldwide fossil beds are evidence of the biblical flood. So that's what I was just, just describing, that map. I wish I could have had a picture of that because I'd, I'd never seen it until just a few weeks ago, a picture like that. And I thought, that is an awesome just, I get the idea. That's just in the United States. Now, there's other fossil beds around the world where people dig fossils up all the time. Dead animals are quickly consumed by, in, by other animals, insects, worms, bacteria, and they're destroyed by the action of the environment. So there are some animals that have, you know, gone, to, gone the way of almost extinction that we don't have fossils of. For example, let's get to this, buffaloes. You know, there was millions of buffaloes running around the United States now they're all gone. There's no fossils of, of, of buffalo. How come there's no fossils of any buffalo? Because they all, the, the environment consumed them, consumed their bodies. Lions in Israel, there used to be lions in Israel. They're not there anymore, but there's no fossils of them any, anymore. Um, schools of fish, and you know, no, you can't read that, but this is a plaque at the British Museum of History it says, Fishy Death. That's actually what it's titled, Fishy Death. The fossils in this slab belong to a school of fish that died in the same place at the same time. Their lake dried out and during a hot spell, leaving the, fish tra the trapped fish to die. And all of a sudden, it's a fossil bed now. Crazy thoughts. It probably got filled up with sediment. Uh, this animal here uh, is a seven-foot itchy sore, fossilized while giving birth. So this is the only one that where it was not a fully grown adult animal. So right there is the baby. The mommy is giving birth and became fossilized, became entrapped in the sediment and became a fossil. Isn't that amazing? Um, and there's a fish in Brazil so perfect of preservation that skin, sail, uh, skin, scales, muscle, fiber, and gills with the arteries and veins are still visible in this specimen. The ovaries are even preserved with developing eggs inside. Uh, plants, the, the plants, the fossils are so complete that they could tell what, what type of chlorophyll was being able to be found in that fossil, in the, in the plant. Uh, this fish, he was eating another fish. They both died, but one fish was eating another fish, and they both got fossilized. Number four, it does not contain countless transitional 
creatures. That's the problem with the fossil evidence as well. Darwin wrote in his book, in a big quote here, he says, why is it, why then is not every geological formation and every stratum full of such intermediate links? Why, why don't it have all of the intermediate things from one species to another? Geology assuredly does not reveal any such finely graduated organic chain, and this perhaps is the most obvious and serious objection which can be urged against my theory. He's even presenting himself an argument why his ideas aren't valid. His solution to the problem was to say that geology just hasn't explored enough, haven't discovered enough fossils. In 1981, uh, Fred Hoyle, was an, who was an honest evolutionist, he said this, Where, wherever one would like to, evidence of major changes in linkages, the evidence is consistently consipiously missing from the fossil record. It's just evident. It's not there. You don't see it. So years of research have not found the enormous numbers of transitional uh, of anything, of invertebrates, and that's a, tr that's a, a trilobite on there. Um, there's just not enough, uh, and there's not enough of any of those things, uh, fish or bats. A, fa a, bo a bat fossil today looks like a bat today. It looks like a, a, just a bat, an actual bat. You, they, they have the same structures. And of course, the pitoris. Number five, it shows gr creatures appearing suddenly in the, in the fossil evidence, fully formed. Stephen Gould said this, a species, a species does not arise gradually by the steady transformation of its ancestors. It appears all at once and fully formed. That's what, it, that's what the fossil record shows. So we're getting close to being done here. I'm going to finish it up. The Cambrian explosion. Anybody ever heard of the Cambrian explosion? So the Cambrian is one of the layers uh, in, the, in those la sediment layers that we talked about. Um, and in the, in the Cambrian explosion, what's called the Cambrian explosion 500 to 600 million years ago, the oceans became oxygenated. So the Cambrian, let me see if I can see it. Where is it? There, right here. So this is at the bottom of the, of the, the chart. So these are the first layers of sediment, and it goes up that way. So the Cambrian explosion occurred here. And what the explosion is, is a tremendous amount of fossils were found in that layer of the sediment. Um, during that time, the oceans became oxygen oxygenated. Animals showed dramatic diversification. The fastest growth in the number and major new animal groups took place, and the first undoubted fossils of any sort of species were found. That includes worms, insects, shellfish, starfish, any of those kind of things. So what caused this explosion, again, would be the flood. Yeah? So let me throw all of that stuff up there, read that. Um, in Genesis chapter 7, verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day, where all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. In verse 19, and the waters prevailed exceedingly upon the earth and all the high hills that were under the whole heaven were covered. But see, some evolutionists, evolutionists have attempted to debunk the lessons of the Cambrian explosion, but have resulted in little significant fossil evidence prior to the Cambrian period. So there's... It's got more, more fossils in the Cambrian layer than any other layer does at all, as far as total numbers of different fossils, because there was a lot of life at, going on at that point in time. The fossil record, number six, the fossil record show, exhibits complexity from the beginning. It shows complexity from the beginning. Evolution, evolution theorized that life arose from simple creatures and developed into higher forms of life but this is not what the fossil record shows. In fact, creatures appear in in, uh, incredibly complex features already intact and no fossil has ever been discovered with a partially formed appendage that would someday become fully useful for survival. As I said earlier, bats look like bats. Uh, the trilobite, uh, even though extinct today, had a tremendous complexity that was evident in the fossil. 
One of the cool things about the um, their, the trilobite's eyes is that it had fi 15 different lenses. I'm sorry, 15,000 different lenses, some species. And then, of course, there's, there's no such thing as a simple cell. So we'll finish with this. John, Job chapter 26. Dead things are formed from under the waters and the inhabitants thereof. And in Mark, 27, 27, Mark 12, 27. He is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Ye therefore do greatly err, Jesus said. So let's wrap all of this stuff up in this, these statements here. From the, from, from the evidence of, for evolution of life, the fossil record disproves evolution. Fossil record is not a support of evolution. It actually disproves evolution. Fossilization is evidence of a great flood. Fossil record does not contain transitional creatures. The fossil record does not contain appearing, anything appearing suddenly. Or what it does show is things appearing suddenly, fully formed. And the fossil record demonstrates complexity from its earliest layers. And the, that would be all the way, you know, back up here real quick. Too far back. There, right there. So the complexity was down here in the Cambrian. It wasn't up here where the, where the big old dinosaurs were at. There was complexity down here. Even, even a little bit in the pre-Cambrian area. But most of the, the majority of fossils were found for this, even though the... You never hear about them in the news. You always hear about the big, hey, we found a big, you know, big, big dinosaur you know, hip bone or something. Last couple of points is the fossil record demonstrates complexity and the fossil record exhibits stasis or stability of species rather than change of the species. So that's evolution and fossils, how we can prove the evidence does not reject God. So what, what the hope that lies within you is that God is real, God is true. We can look at these, these, these evidences that are trying to, oh, here's, here's a bunch of science in your face, and say, this, okay, well, let's talk about that. Because you obviously don't know that science is in God's wheelhouse. It's all part of God's things. So let's pray. Next week, I'm not sure where we're at. There you go, here we are next week. Um, I know this list is incorrect. I think it's, is it morality? I don't remember. Come next week. But I don't remember what we're talking about next week right now, off the top of my head. What's lesson number eight say? Okay. Oh, well, that's fine. Well, let's pray, and we'll be out of here. We're over time. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for today. Thank you for the ability to be able to speak about these things, Lord. And I do pray, Lord, that this would be... Uh